It's hard to think of a more Jewish word than the word synagogue. And yet the word isn't Jewish at all. The word is Greek. It means to gather together. It's a translation of an ancient Hebrew word. And the ancient Hebrew word is the word kahal or kahila. Try it. It appears for the first time in the Torah, the first five books of the, of the Bible. And it means that Hebrew word kahal or kahila means the gathering or the assembly or the congregation. It's used over and over again to speak of the gathering of Israel, the assembly of Israel, the congregation of Israel, particularly as they journey through the wilderness. And so when the Jewish, ancient Jewish scholars and elders made the first translation of the Bible, that was to take the Hebrew Bible and put it into Greek, and it was called the Septuagint long before the New Testament. The New Testament uses it actually. They translated, they, had a, they came to that Hebrew word kahal, kahila, for the congregation of Israel. And they translated that word into a Greek word, and the Greek word was synagogue. But here's the thing. They didn't just translate that Hebrew word into synagogue. They translated it into another, two different Greek words. One was synagogue, and the other one was ekklesia. Ekklesia. Now some of you are getting it, some of you not yet. It appears in the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures, the word ekklesia, when it speaks about Israel. Now what is the ecclesia? Well, we have a book of Ecclesiastes. Why is Ecclesiastes called, you ever think about that? Why is that book called Ecclesiastes? Nobody thinks about that. Because it speaks about a preacher, says the preacher, who's a preacher of a gathering, a convocation. And a convocation, a gathering is called, is the ecclesia. The ecclesi so we get the word ecclesiastical. What does that mean? It means something about a church. The Greek word ecclesia appears in the New Testament is the New Testament word for the word we call church. The New Testament word for church. Now church is not the best word as far as by, by its actual meaning. I mean it's become the word, but it's really not the most accurate translation of ecclesia because church means house of the Lord. But the biblical word for church, it means the gathering or the convocation or the called out ones, the called together ones. So the amazing thing, get this, the synagogue and church are translations of the same exact word. The same exact Hebrew word goes into one part, it's called synagogue in, the, in that ancient translation of the Bible. In other parts it's called the church, the ecclesia, same, the church, same exact thing. Right there it tells you a mystery. You, the church and the synagogue are joined together. Where was the gospel first preached in the land of Israel? In the synagogue. Where? Which is what? Nazareth synagogue, first one. And where else did he teach? All over the synagogues of the land. Where was the gospel first preached to the world? In the synagogues of the Roman Empire. The first church, well actually your first church was the one in Jerusalem. The Ecclesia, the Kahila. And who was, the, who was the leader of it? James, the brother of Messiah. Yaakov, real name, Jacob. He presided over it. I want you to see something. I want you to see, turn to James 2 for a second. James 2. And I want you to see something in the English, then I'm going to show it to you in the original. Okay, verse 1 of chapter 2. My brothers, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, with an attitude of favoritism. If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there comes one in poor and dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, you say, here, sir, sit in the good place. You say to the poor man, stand over there, sit in my footstool. You have made a distinction, and you've become judges with evil motives. So it's saying, don't, don't be partial. But something there. It says if somebody comes into your assembly, well what's it talking about? It's talking, this is James talking, who's talking, who's leading the first church of the whole age. And he says if somebody comes into your assembly talking about your gathering, your church, what does he say? The word there is not church, the word there is synagogue. So here it's talking the first, the leader of the first church is calling your assembly the synagogue. So here they are joined together and they're joined together over and over again. And so the, the biblical word for church is the same word for synagogue. And, I mean, it's, the same, it's a translation of the same word. 
And it's you, the biblical word for synagogue, for actually church, ecclesia, is used to, for the translation what, of the Old Testament word, which speaks about the congregation of Israel journeying in the wilderness. What is the church? The church is the spiritual Israel. Doesn't replace Israel, it joins Israel. It's a spiritual version of Israel. And it's like a, a, a pilgrim people who are journeying through the wilderness to the promised land. So what does Paul say? Ephesians 2. Actually turn to it for a moment. Ephesians 2. What does he say about you who were, made, you were not born of Israel, but you were born again of Israel? Ephesians 2 says at the beginning, it speaks about the Gentiles who have come into the faith, and it says this. Ephesians 2 verse 11. Therefore remember th that you, formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, meaning according to the flesh only, who are called unto uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now you in Messiah, Yeshua, who was formerly, you were formerly far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Messiah. Now, now how have you been brought near? Look at verse 18. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have our access in one spirit in the Father. So then you are no longer strangers, no longer aliens, you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Okay, the first part it says you were strangers excluded from what? the commonwealth of Israel. Then at the last verse it says you are no longer strangers, aliens. You are now fellow citizens. In what? What? What are you fellow, what are you a citizen of? What you were excluded from before you are now a citizen of what? Israel. You are a citizen now. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Now you are a citizen in the commonwealth of Israel. So you who are born again, you weren't born of Israel, you are born again of Israel. And so therefore the church, in the same word as synagogue, is the spiritual Israel. And so what does that make you? It makes you not only a citizen of Israel, more than you're a citizen of America or any other nation, you are a citizen of God's Israel. What does that make you? That makes you an Israelite. Or it makes you an Israeli. Now you say, wait a minute. I can handle Israelite in the Bible. I can understand. Israelites, the, the Israelites walk through the world, the Israelites. But Israeli, that's a, whole, that's a different realm here. When you think of an Israelite, you think of somebody from the Old Testament, most likely. Ancient times. But when you think of an Israeli, what do you think of? You think of a whole different kind of person. You think of somebody in Israel right now. You think of the, 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 the people farming the land, the soldiers, Israelis, Israelis. But you say, well, but you know, do you know something? You may not know this. When the Bible speaks of Israelites, it never speaks of Israelites in the original language. It says Israeli. When it talks about the Israelites, it's not. It's the Israelis in the Bible. That's the word. They, we added the ites. You know, when you get into English, you got all the ites. But in the original, there's no ites. Jebusites, you know, Canaanites. It's not that. It's Canaanite. Israeli. They added the ites. No ites in the Bible. Es in the Bible. So what are you? If you are born again, doesn't matter what you were born in the flesh, you are a spiritual Israeli. And when you go to Israel, you're not just seeing a land of what was, you're seeing a land that a nation that's been brought back from the dead and resurrected by the hand of God. It's a miracle. It's a living nation of Israelis. And so that is a revelation also of who you are now in God. It's not just, again, you're not just an Israelite, you're an Israeli. You are linked to the Israelis of our day and age. They too are part of the mystery of who you are. They're, we've got something that, you know, generations of Christians long for the day to see the day when Israel would be resurrected. But they didn't see it. You have seen it. An amazing picture here for you. And so let's open up this revelation of the Israelis and what has to do with you, the spiritual Israelis. 
In Jeremiah 31 and 30 and 31 it speaks about, and actually in other places as well, it speaks about that the Jewish people would be scattered to the ends of the earth and they will be in exile in the ends of the earth. The word in Hebrew for the exile is called the Galut. Try it. Galut. And Israelis know it. It's, it's based on a word in the Bible. That, that means they were all over in every nation, speaking languages of every nation. But before Israel was a nation, virtually all the Jewish people, I mean except for very few, were all in other lands and other languages, other cultures. They weren't born in Israel. Most of the people in Israel, you go back a few generations, they weren't born there. They were born somewhere around the world. Very few were in the land a few generations back. So when they came to the land of Israel, it was a strange thing. I mean even though they, it was a strange thing for many of them because they were, many of them weren't Middle Eastern at all. From, for their, their culture they had been German, Russian, you know all these things. They spoke a different language. spoke Yiddish. Yiddish is not, he, it's not Hebrew. It's basically German with, with a little bit of Israel, a little bit of Hebrew in it. They didn't have anything to do with farming because they weren't allowed to farm pretty much. They often lived in the cities selling, buying because that's the only thing they were allowed to do in ghettos. The whole thing was farm. So this new way was whole farm. But the real truth was, even though they hadn't been in that land for 2,000 years, the real truth was this was their home, not where they were. This was their real home. This was their real culture. This was their real language. But they didn't know it. It was a strange thing. You know the Hebrew word galut, diaspora, the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jewish people, nations. It means exile. So it means that all that time they were exiled from where they really were, what was their home. So it seemed so strange to them, but they had to learn that it wasn't strange to them. It's the same way in salvation. In salvation, you grow up, unless you're in a Christian home, and even then you still have to come to the Lord, you are in a spiritual galut, exile. You're in a spiritual wandering, just like the Jewish people. You're growing up in a life, you're in a life that is, you think it's your life, but it's really not what you were born for, not what you were created for. You're in a, a culture, you're in a, you have an identity, but it's the old identity. You think it's your identity, but God is saying that's not even, that's not even. The Jewish people thought this was their identity. They come back to Israel and say, okay, there's got to be a new identity now. So even though things, there are things in your life that's all you've ever known, and often that becomes what you think of yourself as your identity, it's not your real identity. Even though it was your, quote, first identity. For instance, you might have been an angry person, but that's not your real identity. You might have been fearful. That's not your real one. You might have known rejection. It's not your real thing. You might be in, have been in bondage all the time. That's not real. Lo a loser all the time. That's not depressed. That's not your identity. That's your galut identity. That's your exile identity. That's you when you're exiled from who God made you to be. But it's not who you are. And it kind of gets us because that's the first thing we knew. And often it's the first things you know that kind of stick with you. But it's not your real identity. You may have carried that into the Lord. But it's not your real identity. The Jewish people when they came to the land they had to give up the old identity. Even the old language. And so even though you're familiar with these things and you might even still picture yourself as that kid, as that thing, as that other thing, but that's not who you are. And we got to get, just as the Jewish people had to, had to open their eyes to a whole new thing, sp physically we got to do that spiritually. That life was your exile from who you were, not who you were. And often again it comes in there, the old self. The Bible says put it off. That's not you. That's not you. You can't put off what's you because you only, only if it's not the real you, you can put it off. You might have been born into it, but that's not who God made you to be. You are something better in God. And the Israelis, you know, when, when they came to Israel, the idea was they were coming home. And that's not just the idea. They were. The, you know, the, the Jews of Europe, well, that's not their own. Russia, whatever, India, China, that's their real home. But to most Jewish people it was a foreign message. I mean, in fact, when, 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 the young Israel, when the young Jewish people, they were the first ones to really return first, their, a lot of their parents disowned them. They said, what are you doing going there? That's not, they hadn't been there for 2,000 years so it wasn't home. It was like leaving tradition to go home. But, they weren't, but they're saying, wait a minute, when they came home, when they came to Israel they said, even though we've never been here, even though it seems foreign to us, we don't know how to, what we're doing here, it's still home. See, when you, re, you know, to, to repent is to return. In Hebrew it's the same word. The word for repentance is teshuva. Try it. 
It, means, it comes from the root word shuv, which means to return. So if you're repenting, you're returning. If you come, you come to God, what's the parable that Messiah gave? To, he gave the parable of the prodigal son. The pro, about salvation. But the prodigal son was at home. Then he left home and came back. Now when you come to God, you weren't there, there first mostly. You came to God. But every time you come to God, in a sense, you're returning to God because that's where you were meant to be in the first place. You know, you weren't in Eden, but someone was. So you're returning to God every time. So to, to repent is to return. The more you grow in God, you're returning to who you were meant to be. That's why it's a return. You're coming home. So in the same way the Israelis came, they came home, but it was all, it seemed so strange to them, but they had to accept, no, it's not strange. This is the real thing. And so therefore, even though it was a totally new thing for them, Middle East was new, even though, but really, ancient times, that was their home. They, you know, they come to the shore, they're going to try to build, they try to farm a land. They weren't, they didn't know how to farm, and they're going to farm this barren land. They had no idea how to do it. They had no idea how to build a city. But they learned it. They'd say, this is what we were born for. Because in ancient times, they did farm the land. In ancient times, they did build. In ancient times, they did all that. So the soul with life in God. That's a physical picture of the spiritual reality. When you come to the Lord, it's, and even not just when you come, even to this day, some things may seem foreign to you. A life of holiness, of purity, of love. So you might say, well, it's just, it just seems not that. I'm trying to do that, but that's not who I, I feel I really am. I'm trying to do that, but I feel I'm really the impure person. But the, what it's saying is, no, that's home. A life of worship, a life of holiness is really home. Every part of your being created by God is meant for that. That's why you're never happy when you're not in God's will. Because God's will is home for you. I say, well, you know, I'm not a real prayer warrior. No, you were born, you were created by God and born again to be a prayer warrior. That's more home than not being one. You know, and I'm not really forgiving. No, forgiveness is home. That's more, that's you. To give, I'm not a giving person. No, that's what you are. But you got to do it. The Israelis felt, I can't farm. I don't have it. Well, once they started doing it, it was home. You got to start doing it, it's home. And continually. They knew, you know, they realized they didn't know what they were doing, but, and the first ones had no idea what they're doing, but they just, it didn't stop them. They just kept going. You may not feel like you can do the things of God. Just do it. Do it anyway. It is home. Home. And it was their true calling. And it was above them. And yet it was their calling. It was their destiny. So your calling is always above you. But, but you are born for it. You got to just do it and believe that that is more your life than falling short and sinning. That's not home. You might be comfortable in that sin, but that's not home. That's your exile. Get back. The truth is that's who you really are created to. When you go to Israel, they use, they use shekels, as you know probably. Why do they use shekels? They could use other things. Because shekels were the money that was in the Bible. So what they did is they resurrected everything from the Bible. So they took the same money that was used then, they gave it a modern face, but it's still the, it's the shekel. And what does that mean? And that's in everything. That's just one example is the money, the shekel. But what is that saying? They brought the Bible. They actually brought the Bible into everything. And I'm not saying they were believers. But they're the physical form of what you are spiritually. So they brought the Bible and they, from, they brought it into every, even their dealings with money. Everything they did was based on resurrecting what was in the Bible. What you once was, wasn't, and now is again. What does that say for the spiritual Israelis? That means you need to, you need to take every, you need to take the Bible into every part of your life. Your money, your, your washing your clothes, your taking out the garbage, your how you drive your car. Nothing is outside redemption. Nothing is outside what God has given. God has a, a purpose for you in everything and He has a spirit to lead you in every part of your life. There's not one part of your life that is to be separated. Bring Him into everything everything. What did they do when they got back to the land? What did the physical Israelis do? They came back and they found it desert. It was, it was the most, it had to be the most forbidding land on earth that had ever been inhabited. Desert, barren. Some parts looked like the moon. It was barren. There wasn't anything growing there. You know, Mark Twain, I share with you, he came there and he said you, you could go for miles without seeing anything, even no, not even a blade of grass. 
They went back, they found that. What else did they find? They found swamps. You know, the part that where there was water was swamps filled with malaria. And so it was disease and barrenness, nothing. There's a famous picture of where they, you know, today, you know, uh, Pam mentioned Tel Aviv, you know, this thriving city. When they, there's a picture like 190 something Tel Aviv. You know what's there? Zero. It's a bunch of people. It's like a crowd of people dressed up as you would in 190 whatever it was. And, and they're, you know, with the with women with the long things and all that. And the men with the hats and all. And they're just staring. They're a crowd together into this vast desert of nothing. That was Tel Aviv. It didn't exist. There was nothing there. But now they, had, they didn't know how to farm. I've shared this. You know, you had the Jewish people who were, who were prohibited from farming for much of 2,000 years because they weren't forbidden for having land. They, and then you have the land that nobody could farm. Nobody on earth could farm that land. People tried to do it. Nothing. It was cursed. God said it. And it came true. And so you got the people who can't farm. You got the land that can't be farmed. Put them together. What happens? A miracle happens. It blossoms as no other land has ever blossomed from nothing. And so they learn they're farming the land, they're bringing water, and all of a sudden there's this desert. What is it? Isaiah said it. Isaiah said the desert will blossom. You know, it will blossom, will bloom in the desert. You could actually go there and see desert land. In the middle of the desert is a farm, is, is flowers, is fruit, all that. You go to Israel, you know Israel is the one land on earth that at the end of the 20th century it had more trees than at the beginning. Only land. You know how many trees they planted? About 200 million. The Israelis who didn't know how to farm, all of a sudden these miracles are happening. You go to Israel, it's amazing. You look at the earth, you, there's, there's fruit. There's, there's, fl there's flowers. There's, it's watered even, I mean, almost out of nothing. In fact, so much so that Israel actually exports, I mean, it, 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 it actually sends flowers across the world and fruit across the world from the desert. God gave them the power. It was God doing it. Not the, but God gave them the ability to be part of a miracle of making the deserts bloom. So what does that say to the spiritual Israelis? You are called to do the same thing. You are given the power in Messiah to make what is dead come alive. That which is barren to bear fruit. Before you came to the Lord, your life was that. Your life was the barren part. Spiritually, you might say, oh, you might have done it, but spiritually barren. But now God is making your barren life bloom like a rose in the desert to bear the fruits. What fruit? Of love where there wasn't love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that. But in Israel, he doesn't just bear fruit. He bears fruit out of dry ground. Fruit that should not exist has no natural reason to exist. The fruit so you were called to bear also has got to be miraculous. God has called you to bear fruit with no natural explanation. What does that mean? You're called to bear fruit. When you have no reason to love that person, God has called you to bear the fruit of love for that person. When, when they've given you barren, desert, nothing, you're called to bear it. See, anybody can love back somebody who's loving you. But to love back the person who doesn't love you, that's a miracle. To love back the person who hates you, that's a greater miracle. That's the miracle of bearing fruit from a desert. When you have no earthly reason to give thanks and praise God, and you praise Him anyway, you're bearing the fruit in the desert. That's the miracle fruit. It was what was happening recently when all those rockets were fired at Israel from the Gaza Strip by Hamas that was supported by Iran that made me turn to the book of Daniel. Now the Bible reveals this demonic entity. In, in the Hebrew it's Sar Paras, Persia. Sar Paras, the principality of Persia. What happened to it? The nation of Persia has not died. It's still alive. And principalities don't die. These two things put together means what would the prince, the Tsar Paras, the prince of Persia be today? It would be the principality of Iran. Iran is Persia. Now under the Shah of Iran, a while back, Iran was not against Israel, but it was overthrown by a radical Islamic regime which is in power to this day. Amazing to fathom that the same principalities are at work. They don't disappear. 
And today, that could be today behind the news, can be ancient principalities. Behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah. And it reveals something else, because ancient Persia was not Islamic, it was pagan. But you had that principality. Well, the fury now against Israel, against America, for terror, for Hamas and Hezbollah, is Islamic. Yet what it reveals is behind, be deeper than Islamic, deeper than the label, deeper, is our principalities. They don't care if it's Islamic or not. They will use anything. And that, that means, and that, take, take this further, this revelation, because it means not just that. It means that there could be organizations, movements, nations, people in the 21st century that maybe consider themselves secular, doesn't matter, right wing, left wing, but behind it may be principalities ancient principalities. Even that things that are happening in America, I won't go more into it now, but this is, pray for me, because this is linked to the book that I have not been able to write to because, because I've had this, there's such warfare about stopping this book, but is even linked to things happening in America right now affecting lives that are linked to ancient principalities. But that's for another time. The revela but this is also about that in another way. The revelation that the angel had given to Daniel had to do with the Jewish people in the end times. And it's blocked by the principality of Persia, Iran. Today, Israel views as its greatest enemy, not the Soviet Union is gone, not even China, not even, but Iran. That happens to be the same one that is linked to the principality that's trying to stop the revelation of Israel in the last days. So now Israel comes back. Think about that. Israel comes back as the prophecy, the, the Bible said, coming back. Israel comes back into the world and it's as if it activated, reactivated the principalities. Because the principality is trying to stop the revelation that's talking about what's happening now or what's going to happen with Israel. Iran is behind it. Where did they get those missiles from? They got them from Iran or they got them from money to pay it from Iran. All from Iran. Which behind Iran is the principality which wants to destroy Israel. Where did all this conflict begin? It began, this most recent one, began on the Temple Mount or is linked to the Temple Mount. Why? For the same reason that Israel itself is the center of conflict and fury. Why? Because the Jewish people have to, why do they have to battle just to stay alive? Because of the purposes of God. Because the Bible says that the purposes of God come through that nation, come through Israel. If you're born again today, it's because the purpose of God came through Israel and you are born again today. They brought the word, they brought, it wasn't them, it's about God, but they brought the word, they brought Messiah, they brought salvation so you could be saved. And it is foretold that at the end they will again, the nation of Israel will come back, it's back, will usher in the purpose of God, will usher in the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom of God. And Paul said when that happens, when that happens, when they come back to God, the curse itself is going to be lifted off the creation. How big is that? The enemy's finished. And the knowledge of God will cover the earth. Now this is big. This is the end game. It's the fulfillment of all the prophecies and purposes of God that darkness knows it. The, they don't, the, the, the enemy doesn't know everything, but he knows some things. The forces of hell know it. The Sar Paras the principality of Persia knows it. He stopped, he's tried to stop the angel from even talking about it to get to Daniel. Since the days of Israel's rebirth, the forces of hell have been trying to wipe it out. From the very moment, the day that it was declared, they tried to wipe it out. And the whole world the United Nations, you know, with all that they do, all the nations of the world kill, you know, China, Soviet Union, others killing millions of their own people, never condemned them. But they have condemned the tiny little democracy called Israel more than it's condemned all the nations of the world put together. What is that? That is demonic. That is not natural. That makes no sense. But it makes sense spiritually. Because Israel is back for a reason. And within Israel, it centers on the city of Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is always the conflict. Always. And within Jerusalem, 
It centers on a little piece of land called the Temple Mount. Because that is where God's going to reign. That's where Messiah is coming. So that's where the temple stood. And so the enemy has focused his fury on Israel, the Jewish people, on the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount. What has the enemy done? Well, you look at, go to the Temple Mount today, and you will find on the Temple Mount is a dome of a rock, a Muslim, right on where the Holy of Holies may have been. Right on there. Why? Because you can't build with that thing on there. On the eastern side of the Temple Mount, the Golden Gate, through which Messiah is going to enter. And you have a reproduction of it right on that corner there. It's all walled up. Why? Because a Muslim ruler said, who told the Messiah is coming, we're going to wall it up. When you go to the Temple Mount, they don't, they, they, they're getting a little looser, but they, they don't, don't even allow you to pray there. Like, why is the enemy so, why is it so much, why? Can't pray, can't open up a Bible. I always try to nevertheless get the ironic blessing in without them arresting me. One time I thought, you know, because you know, we got kicked off once, you know. But one time I was there. I, this is not in the notes. You're, I get a little looser on the second service. Uh, <laughs> one time I was going to, I was going to pray and, 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 and all of a sudden, because usually they're watching all over everything you do and they're all gone. All the Islamic authorities are gone and we didn't know what happened. Turned out somebody from our group, a lady, one, one of the buses, uh, ran up the Temple Mount waving an Israeli flag. <laughs> they all got distracted. I gave the blessing. So he said, from now on, we got to have somebody running up with that. No, no, no. Why is the enemy so sensitive about that Temple Mount? Because of what is coming. Coming. And so all this that happened was triggered by the Temple Mount. It triggered all this hell, fury against Israel, linked to Iran. The war, funded by it, but linked to the Temple Mount. 